introduction and most importantly for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be back in New England. You know, so I have a really nice and fun memories from, from the area here. So very excited to be here. Um, and as, you know, you probably know Montana. If you haven't visited Montana, uh, you probably have a mental image of Montana, which is basically Yellowstone and glacier and fly fishing and great skiing, which is true. Uh, but that's basically pockets within Montana. If you go outside those pockets in Montana and you want to visit the rural landscape, um, it will look something like this. This is most of the our agricultural systems in Montana. I don't think there's any system that is more simplified than this one. We have one crop every two years. So our systems are basically wheat and fallow. And the reason we have that is because moisture issues. Uh, rainfall there goes anywhere between 9 to perhaps 14, 15, 16 inches per year. In those areas where we have 16 inches, there are some, there's some diversification, food crops, uh, camelina, some speciality crops. But you know, the hardcore of the agricultural systems is big. And because of moisture conservation <coughs> and problems of soil erosion, uh, farmers have been moving more and more towards non tillage which kind of makes sense. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Uh, so, which makes sense uh, from an issue of uh, moisture conservation and soil conservation. Now, um, it didn't take me much time when I was hired there to learn that uh, weed management in the, uh, and I'm a weed scientist there, so weed management in the fallow phase is based basically on repeated applications on Roundup. And during the crop phase, uh, it's a little bit more challenging, meaning you need to know which weed species you have, and then uh, look at which herbicides are more appropriate for that weed set of species. Um, so you can say that my job at Montana State is kind of the main tag ad, it's basically <laughs> the most boring job in town. <laughs> <laughs> Not very exciting. Uh, but my my kind of uh, take home message today, oh sorry, is that, uh, so in case I put you to sleep, you know my take home message is that even in these extremely simplified systems, they're very complex uh, biological interactions. And um, this is very interesting from a you know, basic science point of view, but if we want to do applied research, uh, I think it's important to start knowing those tropic interactions, those biological interactions, because knowing them will allow us to make more informed management decisions. And the third and last take home message is kind of a disclaimer. Um, it is difficult, but it's possible. And I think we are starting to tap into the black box of these complex interactions and knowing how they behave and starting to learn how to make those decisions. Now, of course, we didn't get to these systems just by chance. Um, no more than a hundred years ago, these systems looked more something like this, uh, a prairie mostly dominated by perennial plants, um, high diversification, and it took a tremendous amount of energy to transform this system in these highly simplified systems that we have today. <coughs> now, you know, the next step we may want to do now is to start thinking about what are the ecological consequences of such a <coughs> gigantic transformation at the landscape level. Uh, first of all, of course, reduce biodiversity, associated with that, losing a lot of ecosystem services. Um, we increase the disturbance regime. If we want to maintain these systems at these early stages of recession, we need to keep disturbing them by adding more energy in the form of pesticides, harvesting. But the core of the action there is definitely chemical inputs. Uh, there's around 180,000 hectares that are sprayed every year for insects, around 100,000 hectares that are sprayed for pathogens. But the action is with the weeds, there's around 2.3 to 2.4 million hectares which are sprayed every year for weed management. Uh, which basically means 
million pounds of artificial ingredients of herbicides, uh, which definitely allow farmers uh, to transform the system. And their impact has been so large that if you go to moccasin, and this is uh, in the experimental station, one of the experimental stations um, that you have in Montana, you will see this monument. I don't know if you remember that monument. It's basically the first place west of the Mississippi River where 2,4-D was applied for the first time. Hmm. So you know, it, it, it makes sense because having you know such a such a such a herbicide that will allow to differentially kill broadleaf weeds in a grassy crop was a gigantic transformation for farmers. They allowed them to intensify the cropping systems, um, get more efficiency for their time labor. So it was gigantic. But perhaps focusing so much in one solution may not be the best approach. And I think the first answer for that can be seen if you just cross the highway and go less than half a mile and visit the town of Moccasin, and this is what you will see. Basically a ghost town. And that's what we see all across Montana. Uh, rural communities are not living, they're basically disappearing all across Montana. So yes, we are increasing our intensification of the cropping system, but not necessarily that translates into better rural communities. Um, other issues associated with this approach to uh, weed management. In the case of 2,4-D, uh, there are many, many studies where they have shown that they are correlated uh, with increased mark formation issues, uh, cancer uh, rates. And of course, you cannot do an experiment with these people with 2,4-D, but they've seen that uh, people who tend to live in areas where they apply too many herbicides, they tend to have certain diseases. Um, another problem that we see, even in a place where we have 10 to 14 inches of pre precipitation per year, we start to see herbicides in surface water and groundwater. Uh, there were a lot of complaints with Amino Clearly, and the Department of Ag just went and did a little survey, not very intensive, and they have found you can see Amino Clearly in around 12 uh, groundwater wells and in three places in surface water. Uh, if you come, if you go to the Midwest, uh, problems such as uh, uh, atrazine in rivers is really gigantic. But even in these dryland systems, we start to see these problems. Why is that an issue? Well, if you're a gardener, you'll start to see your tomato plants all wilted because of this amino period. So there started to be all this conflict between what farmers use in their crops and rangelands as to what you can do in your backyard. And of course, you know. 150 something years after Darwin, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. We put a lot of selective pressure by using herbicides, and what do we see? Herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, in Montana, we have five species which have been confirmed to be resistant to herbicides. Uh, one of the cases is wild oat, major hit there, uh, which has uh, multiple resistance, resistant to three mode of actions, and we highly suspect it's an enhanced metabolism type of resistance found it a couple of years ago, so really problematic. Um, two months ago, they confirmed kochia, which is basically a Christmas tree type of plant, uh, and maybe a million seeds per plant, uh, which is resistant to glyphosate 50 miles north of the border with Canada. Uh, so it's a tumbleweed, it just takes a wind to come. So I heard some, I read some weed scientists are proposing to build a fence. So we <laughs> haven't Arizona, learned Arizona anything. Like Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they did it. They said, we should start, I mean, that was an idea that actually was proposed in 1840 uh, between South and North Dakota, then it came back in 1945, and then someone in North Dakota said, hey, look at this idea, doesn't look so bad. Anyway, so, so you know, th there, are, there are a lot of issues. So I think, you know, after 60 years of this <laughs> evolution of, of the, the the herbicide center approach to manage our weeds, we can say, yeah, it has been a very easy solution, has definitely dropped a lot of benefits, but at the same time, we need to start acknowledging some of the problems or the trade-offs. So if that's the case, um, then I think we need to ask, can we you know, bring a little bit of ecological perspective or ecological
ontological knowledge into the minds of our other ecosystems. So in my specific area, which is best management, we start by asking this question, is it true that even this very simple system has complex biological interactions? That was the first question that, that we ask ourselves. So let's explore them. We have our crops, wheat, uh, a lot of nutrients and resources there, but the truth, every time you plant winter wheat, you're going to get cheap grass because they're so similar biologically that they're going to be there. So, you know, they will be starting to compete for resources and you have, you know, this commonly studied crop wheat competition. In another department, you know, plant science and plant pathology department, uh, plant pathologists will be studying pathogens that will be affecting crops. Now it happens that these plants are evolving in the same environment and the pathogens will like grassy plants so they will probably be infecting those grassy weeds. So by differentially affecting crops and weeds they may start to shift the competition between crops and wheat. And on the top of that we definitely have our environment. So the first question we asked was to see the role of wheat variety, uh, wheat biotype, and environmental stresses, such as nitrogen, on the relationship between crops and weeds, and how it is affected by pathogens. And in order to um, answer that, uh, I've been working with Mary Burroughs, who's a plant pathologist, and Zach Miller, who's uh, our postdoc, and Noel Orloff, who just finished her, her master. And uh, we've been doing a lot of several studies. I'm going to show one, one experiment. That's our field study. Um, basically, our field study follow a basic uh, split plot design. Our main plot uh, was the nitrogen application level. We wanted to have a high nitrogen and a low nitrogen level, but oops, something happened, which was we didn't notice that there was a lot of you know background nitrogen that was in experimental farms or from previous experiments we end having a gradient of nitrogen. So when I present you with the result, instead of being high and low, it will be, unless we did in a greenhouse situation, uh, it will be high levels of nitrogen. Yeah? So a gradient of nitrogen. And then <coughs> at the subplot level, we either had a disease, which was the wheat stick mosaic virus, or no disease, and then we have a wheat treatment, which will be a wheat free situation, or two, um, uh, summer animals, which was wild oat and green foxtail, or winter animals, cheap grass. And then we wanted to assess how you know, competition between the crops and the weeds were affected by the presence or the level of nitrogen and the presence of the disease in these regions. So we have this half a meter in diameter rings inside each block. So I, and I will be showing results today with the cheap grass, just for cheap. Okay? So you know, Mary had been uh, doing a lot of inoculation with the wheat free mosaic virus at a greenhouse scale, you know, a couple of hundred plants. But then we realized we needed to spray or inoculate, I don't know how many, like four or five miles of wheat and lines of wheat. So how do you do that? So first you grow a lot of spring wheat in the greenhouse, um, then you spray, uh, you reinfest it, you make sure this disease, then you clip it and you put it in a, a food processor and you grind it, you make a gigantic mess that was in the uh, kitchen of the uh, experimental farm. So only our farm manager allowed us to, to do such a mess there. And then uh, you rent around an industrial air compressor, mm -hmm. a 10,000 feet of hose, <laughs> and build these guns. Uh, basically has a spray painter in, in, the, in the tip and you basically spray it and you know, it was a, a big party of spraying and grinding uh, things. So once we have um, our field spray, uh, we wanted to confirm if they had the disease or not. So we sampled some leaf tissue and we basically did a, uh, an ELISA test that would allow us to confirm that yes, we were able to infest them. The caveat here, we mechanically infested the plants with the pathogen. The transmission disease would be vector it's a mite, it's a little bit different, and I can explain that in, 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 the, in the question if anyone has a, any question about that. But we've been exploring that the difference between mechanical inoculation and kind of a biologically based uh, transmission. But 
Anyways, when we look at the results, this is the five levels of nitrogen that I was talking, mm -hmm. and this is the incidence for the four species. And what you can see here is that for wheat, as we increase nitrogen, we increase the incidence of the disease. For wild oat, um, it was kind of constant. It didn't change the function of the resource. And for the other two species, basically, they weren't affected by the pathogen. A little bit in, in chicas, but very little. So then we went to the field, and we wanted to assess what happened with the competition uh, between crops and weeds. We used these rings, and we marked individual plants. And so this is, again, the five levels of nitrogen. And this is wheat yield uh, under the presence or the absence of the disease. Blue is no disease. And what you can see is that at the high nitrogen levels, there was a yield penalty by having the disease. So that disease did not affect uh, yield at the low levels of the nitrogen. Uh, in terms of the wheat, I'm not going to show the results. Um, nitrogen definitely impacted the biomass and the seed production, but again, it was not affected for chicas for the disease level. So, you know, we can now say that the uh, impact of the wheat and the virus on the yields will be mediated by the levels of the environmental uh, stressor nitrogen. But what about the disease dynamics? What about what happened with the mites? Also mites re respond to the presence of the uh, nitrogen. Um, so this is a greenhouse study that we did um, where we have two levels of nitrogen and this is the population growth rate of the vector at the low and the high nitrogen and you can see that it takes around six days to double in population size uh, in a low nitrogen situation and it takes less than four days uh, to double in population size in a high nitrogen situation. So, you know, the probability of spreading the disease in a high nitrogen situation becomes larger when you have the resource. So in order to test this idea, we went back to the field and established this little plot uh, where we have wheat. Uh, we knew the amount of nitrogen we have there, so we're uh, modifying the availability of nitrogen. And then we put a plant infected with the mites in the center of the plot, and then which was a, a mite was transmitting the disease as a virus. Uh, uh, so then we came back and checked how far that might and the virus move within the plot. And what you see here is that the probability of a weak plant to be infested by those mites will be larger as we increase the nitrogen. So again, the resource could actually be backfiring on you in terms of the disease margin. So, you know, I think kind of this gave us a support to the idea of that yes there are complex interactions and those complex interactions are mediated by the environment and the environment will be acting differently on your crops on your wheat on your disease and the vectors of the disease so it's a, it, it is complex so each one of the components of the system behaves differently but now we need to ask another layer to the question is so how do we make any management of the system there it's a complex system and we want to manage it. So let's go back to the system here. We have our crops, our weeds, our disease, and let's make it a little bit more complex. Let's have an insect. Uh, so we have the wheat stem sawfly, uh, which is the number one insect that we have pests in, in Montana. And it's really devastating. Um, as a wheat scientist, I was kind of hurt when they told me that that was the case. But I've seen fields which are just totally nailed down by the insect, they just you know, lose all the crops there. So the wheat stem sawfly overwinters within the, the, the wheat, and the larvae penetrates and burrows within the stems and basically lodge the stems and they fall, okay? But they can overwinter in any grassy plant. They have evolved actually in this environment, so they can overwinter in grassy plants. And their behavior is, again, differently. If they overwinter in wild oat, they will die. If they overwinter in cheatgrass, 
state can survive and produce a new generation. Now the reproductive rate of the wisdom supply is different, it's less in chikras than in wheat. So yeah, it's a little bit different there. And interestingly, um, disease can also impact the wisdom supply. Why is that? Uh, in this case, we have a fusarium front root, the one that we were studying. Uh, the fusarium can actually attack the larvae of the insect, as well as kill the parasitoid that will be killing the insect. So it's, it's a really complex set of relationships. And again, we have our environment that will be modifying all these relationships. And we want to make these things difficult. We want to manage them. We want to make informed management decisions. Now the problem is that when we make a management decision, there are some contradictions there. Uh, for example, the, wheat, the, the insect department, again, we have a different department. Now we have the entomology department. Mm -hmm. The entomology department, people, they, they will say, you need to have solid stem varieties because the insect uh, you know, can penetrate, but the larvae will die in those solid stems, so they will not launch. Those varieties, you know, are not very high yielding varieties. The plant pathologists have their own varieties which are resistant to the pathogen. Now, as a wheat scientist, I recommend increase your seeding rates so you make your crop more competitive. The problem there is that if you increase your uh, seeding rates, there's more moisture stress, and as you increase your moisture stress, you increase your disease risk. So, good for the wheat, bad for the pathogen. And also, when you increase your seeding rates, the solidness of the stems disappears. S and now, again, good for the wheat, bad for the insect. So farmers can make a decision, and if they make a decision in one direction, that decision can backfire on them. So how do they make decisions? So how do we take into account all these relationships and make a management decision? So to answer that question, we gather a relatively large group across uh, Idaho and Wyoming and North Dakota, and in Montana we have a plant pathologist, Ben and Dyer, an entomologist, David Weaver, a statistician, uh, Jim Robinson Cox, that's the real brain. Behind that is the grad student, Lai Karen. Uh, he's the one, he, he has a uh, master in stats and another master in animal and race science, and now he's doing a PhD in stats and environmental science. So he can, he understands, you know, going to the field and doing very, you know, hardcore stats. It's one of those special cases. So he's, he takes all this credit for what I'm going to be showing you. In Montana, uh, we selected three field sites kind of uh, following a north-south gradient. <coughs> Inside of each, in each site, we selected a one hectare to acres uh, field within commercial farms, and we follow a split-split plot design. Um, first, we have three reps. Um, the three reps are here, and then within each rep, we have three uh, crop varieties. One crop variety, which is the soft light resistant variety, the solid stem. The other one, which is a draw tolerant variety, I will use the SFRDT for draw tolerant for the pathogen, and then the high yielding variety in blue. So that's the first split. Uh, sorry, that's a whole plot. Then we seed it at three different rates. So the recommended rate would be the medium, and the low, and a high. And remember, that would be you want to manage for your weeds, or your pathogens, or your insects. You have to make a decision there. And then we wanted to have a gradient of weed pressure, so we spray um, maverick, which is a herbicide for cheatgrass, at three different rates at the soup soup plot. Um, basically, we have a 0.2, so very weedy, 0.4, some weeds, and 0.8, almost no, almost no weeds there. And again, to know what happened now with the insects and the pathogens and the crops and the wheat and the level of nitrogen. At one point, we used these rings. Now we have five rings. Three rings were left during the whole summer. Two were harvested half the way to kind of make a correlation to visual estimate and bio. Okay? So, if you don't believe me, we made a big mess. <laughs> uh, you can see uh, you can see from Google Earth our field site. Uh, you can see here. <laughs> three reps and all these different cultivar varieties. So early
Normally in the growing season with a non-tilled seeder, we uh, planted our varieties, and then we selectively apply our herbicides, and then this is a general look of our some of one of our field sites. Um, we went to each plot and uh, check emergence and percentage cover of the weeds. Uh, then we establish our rings. Uh, we measure height and uh, ground cover by species. And then uh, we harvest two of the rings half the way to get biomass. And in, uh, when fall came, we harvest everything. We collected all the biomass within the rings. Then we harvest the whole plot and we took some soil nitrogen levels to know how much nitrogen was there available and how much nitrogen we need to add for the next year. And then we were very happy because we said, great, now we have a lot of information collected from one site. We will be able to put you know, everything into a multiple regression type of equation and we'll find situation. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Then we went back to the lab, separated each individual stems um, uh, cut the stems, check for the presence of the uh, soft fly, check if that soft fly has a, a, a parasitoid or not, and also check for fissaria. So now we feel we, are, we have a lot of information, but unfortunately, life is not that simple. Uh, then we realize that how do we combine all this information that comes from three totally different disciplines, three departments, people have not talked, we didn't know how to put all that information together. Seems easy, but you will be using different statistical tools for each one of these relationships. And most importantly, um, you know, the how do we make sense uh, biologically <coughs> of any potential statistical interaction? You know, the relationship between chikras and fissarium will be totally different than the relationship between chikras and weeds and sulfur. But most importantly, through its impact on fusarium, cheatgrass will also be impact, impacting, for example, with stem software. There's all these, not just direct interactions, now we need to start thinking all these indirect interactions that are occurring within this system. And that's when things became a mess, and luckily uh, we have this statistician coming on board, uh, because what they said is we're going to be using a path analysis, which is basically a, a Structural equation modeling approach. Uh, you set up your set of relationships and simultaneously uh, solve those set of equations. But our problem was that uh, we have, for some situations, first of all, not a lot of replications, three sites, three reps. Um, we didn't have a great coverage. Some areas have a lot of fusarium, some very few cheek crust, so we didn't have a really nice, clean set. So um, what we decided to use was a Bayesian network type of analysis. Um, I didn't know much about Bayesian stats, so I took my stats course because I never taught me Bayesian, but I'm liking it more and more. Um, basically uses your pre-existing knowledge um, and allows you to draw conclusions from relatively small sample size and gives you information relevant to management. So you know, that's kind of exactly what we were looking for. This is my stats 101 lecture, okay, in one slide. In the frequency stats that I was taught, you know, many years ago, you have your data, and then you have your hypothesis, and then it's the probability of your data to follow that hypothesis, so you um, reject or fail to reject the new hypothesis. That's what you, you know, do with an ANOVA test. In Bayesian stats, uh, what you do is you have a prior knowledge. You say, I think, the relationship will be something like this, your prior knowledge. Then you have your data, and then you check the probability of the data to adjust to that prior knowledge or not. So it assigns the probability of the hypothesis. Once you run your test, you have your posterior probability. So the taller and skinnier, the better, and you will see this bell-shaped curve in my graph. So let's see how it works. How can we make management decisions? So, relationship between chikras and fusarium, chikras and weed, uh, and, and disease. So remember, fusarium, we need to go reduce seeding densities. So you maintain yield. You reduce seeding densities, you increase your chikra, less competitive crop, and you can see here in the low density, we have a lot of chikras, and in 
so much in the high. But cheap crust will also be impacting TCRM as an alternative host. So in here, what we have is the uh, what percentage of uh, the odds, sorry, the odds of increasing your disease risk for each gram of cheap crust. Okay, and this is in drug tolerant variety, the one that the plant pathologist will be recommended. And basically, this is saying oops, that the best management decision uh, will be to go for a low sitting rate of a, in a draw tolerant variety. And that's, that's a recommended decision. But that's a not a very uh, <coughs> building variety. A farmer would say, yeah, I really don't like that variety, not very high yield. Can I use the same approach and go for the high yielding variety and reduce the sitting rate? No, actually that's the worst decision. So this is the high yielding variety the chances of getting infected with TCRM increases a lot if you go to the low sitting rate. Why is that? Because you allow now the cheap grass to go into the system, and cheap grass is an alternative host of the disease. And you can see here, low sitting rate, a lot of cheap grass. You can see the cheap grass here, and all these white heads that were brought by the presence of the disease. So what about the insects? Again, we have the cultivar, solid stem, for the soft line, um, but the cultivar will also be affecting the competitive interaction with cheap grass, effect on yields, and the cheap grass is a host for soft line. Again, we have all these interactions. So in a weedy environment, like this one, you have so much cheap grass that basically it doesn't really matter. I mean, basically this is your yields, okay? Yields and the posterior density the soft light tolerant or the draw tolerant at different seeding rates, you can see there's no difference. You have to control your weeds or you lose all your yield. But can we reduce herbicide rates and manage weeds and insects at the same time? Well, if we don't know anything about these interactions, we'll say, okay, to manage weeds, increase your seeding rates, right? Manage insects, solid stem, right? Is that right? <laughs> I know. Well, no, totally wrong. That's the worst decision. This is the yield again, and the green one is the high seeding rate of the soft light tolerant variety. Why is that? Again, you lost your solidness of the stems. So you can, you know, you may be more competitive for your weeds, but totally lost the work because of your uh, insects. And indeed, the best decision in that situation will be to hire a high density of the draw tolerant crop. Again, manage your weeds will be more important in this kind of mixture situation. And in a cheap grass free environment, this is 0.8 of the herbicide rate, um, the worst decision will go for the high seeding rate of the soft light tolerant variety. Again, you lose the solidness of the stem, a uh, lot of lodging, or having a high seeding rate of the, the draw tolerant variety. There's a lot of intraspecific competition. You know, agronomists came to this seeding rate for some reason, because you don't go for higher if you don't have something to compete against. And in the, indeed, the best decision there will be the medium seeding density soft light tolerant. So you can see we can start making informed decisions uh, knowing that. So it is possible, but the take home message is that there are trade-offs. You cannot you know, just go for everything at the same time. So we started to learn how things happen within the crop phase. But now the question is, what about the fallow phase? It's still going to be that boring phase where you can only apply Randa or basically there is life beyond Randa. Can I do something there, right? So in the last couple of years, uh, we started to work in terms of can we go and graze those fallow spaces with sheep and control your weeds and reduce both uh, herbicide application or perhaps tillage intensity. And that makes sense because in Montana, we still have close to a quarter million uh, sheep. Um, we need forage. And 
you know, has been used to control risks in range and situations. So can we bring it to a problem? That's something we've been asking with, uh, together with Pat Hatfield. Um, we'll basically produce no erosion if you compare it with the Helix situation and no resistance because we are not applying any herbicide there, so no resistance problem. There will be some nutrient cycling there. You know, there will be recycling those nutrients. Source of income, um, I'm very cured for taking photos. <laughs> Uh, now there's this kind of feeling that animals will not like to graze uh, weeds. Uh, this is a um, herbicide commercial, and the cow is saying, well, in this side of the fence, I'm a lawnmower, you're basically a weed eater. And you can see here that she's not very happy trying to eat those weeds. So um, kind of the first question we ask our dogs, is that true? I mean, it's possible to feed weeds to a sheep, or do they hate that? And if they do that, what are the consequences? Again, we're putting a select and management practice, it's going to be some consequences of that. And we assess that at the community level. So uh, we have this experimental site. Again, we have three reds. Uh, I think it's 45 plots, relatively large in size. And we are managing the fallow phase, either mechanically, grave, or with chemicals. Uh, we have, well, we're finishing the study now, but we have a continuous wheat phase, uh, alfalfa phase, so kind of a perennial crop or a continuous annual crop, and then we have a diversified rotation of uh, pea, hay, barley, uh, and wheat. So this is a side-by-side -side photo of the, you can see in the front the mechanical, and in the back the chemical plots, and these are the grazed plots. So they look totally different. Um, uh, so the first thing we want to know is do they eat uh, weeds? So we did this, what we call the full chase study. We put a lot of weed seeds, so we kind of overwhelm the existing seeds in the seed bank and see what happened there, okay? And we follow those populations using the, these rings. We knew how many emerged, if they survived, how many seeds produced, etc. So I'm going to show you a couple of photos. Uh, this is the grade plot. And these are the areas where we put while those orchid crops. So you can see almost nothing, and these are our chemically managed plots. So, you know, we have a lot of weeds. Now, when I show these photos to the cropping system specialist, he's like, no way, that's not possible. I can control those cheat grass plants with herbicide. So, are we such bad farmers? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the truth is that we had. 50,000 seeds per square meter, so tons of seeds. And if you look how many emerge and survive, and if you have a, I think it was like 90% control with a herbicide, we still have a lot of survivors there. Now you can go and get a, a herbicide efficacy going to 98%, 97%, if you go exactly the best time, you know, when they are this big. But it was so wet that we needed to wait a lot till we spray, so that's why we got 90% control. So, not that we were, I mean, we didn't spray at the right time, but we could not do that. So, in terms of the communities, we have these three one square meter areas, and we follow the community two times. And you can see, in terms of the number of species, we have more species in the graze than in the chem or the mechanically fallow system, so more species, more diversity. Um, and also totally different communities. Um, you can see here, this is the grace community. Quite a lot of uh, dandelions. So we have a lot of perennial plants. So in conclusions, <laughs> say that yes, sheep actually eat weeds, they don't hate it, they're very happy. Uh, but what we expect, we have now this glutamine factor, we don't use herbicides, we don't use tillage, we have different management practices, and there will be some species that they don't like to eat, such as Australian elm wheat or dandelion. So, you know, there could be some escapes there, but definitely this is not our crop. Okay, this is not what happened. And we didn't see that. Um, and indeed, <coughs> after 40 years, the yields in the graze were similar to the chemically managed in wheat uh, and the uh, mechanically managed uh, mechanically managed plot, with a caveat that we added a bit of nitrogen. Still get the same yields there. However, in 
2001, things went a little bit out of control. Our technician quit the job without telling us, and when we went there, uh, we saw a lot of Canada thistle. So again, if you do not graze at the right time, or you don't spray at the right time, you will get these you know, things and close to hell. So it's not that easy to make these informed decisions. You can do it, but you need to be on the top of the, of the problem. So in conclusion, we increase you know, more species, uh, different communities, and now we start to ask ourselves, and we got a, we're starting to do this study next summer, what are the ecosystem services provided by that different weed community? We have more diverse, are we getting more pollinators? Are we getting more parasitoids? We're starting to work more on the food web type of analysis. Are we getting different food webs in a graze versus a kill system? mostly focusing on organic systems. Now, the new addition we, where we want to go now, um, can we use those sheep to terminate cover crops in organic systems? In a, such a dry environment, you know, termination of cover crops is a major problem because you terminate soil erosion, you lose all the benefits. So um, we went to our um, horticultural farm this is a two acres area where we have our cover crops. I think this was hairy veg, and we put our sheep. That's a couple of days after they put them. The first day, I went there and I couldn't see the sheep. They were, you know, this tall cover crop. Okay, so that was a couple of days later, and this is a week later. So they can definitely terminate the cover crops. The question is now, um, and if this is a certified organic farm, can we do that in an organic system? What are the benefits? in terms of, for example, greenhouse gas emission, carbon sequestration, and most importantly, the social barriers to adopt this integrated system. Farmers don't want to be ranchers, ranchers don't want to be farmers. Can we bring your sheep to your farm? You know, who, can, who pays who, who? I'm feeding your sheep or I'm just terminating my cover crop or, you know, killing my wheat. So it's benefits in both, uh, um, for both ends. So I hope that I, been able to show you <laughs> that uh, my systems are not really that that boring. Uh, they're actually that's just a question.